Hello and welcome back to the back porch and to another session of back porch forestry. It's a crisp, clear morning this morning, beautiful morning, great opportunity to, to sit and learn together uh, about the subject of forestry. I'm Dr. David Merker, Extension Forester with the University of Tennessee and back porch forestry includes a series of what I'm calling 3030s, roughly 30 slides in 30 minutes. They're not overly detailed, but instead offering just general education on the topics of trees and forests and forest management. The intended audience is private forest landowners, but of course others might find this interesting and useful too. So at the conclusion, you'll find a participant survey. I hope that you'll take the time to fill that out. I'll also have uh, some information on where you can find some publications that kind of elaborate on the topic that we're covering today. So kick back on your porch and let's enjoy this session together of Back Porch Forestry. Back Porch Forestry. We're going to be sub studying the subject of silviculture um, over this session and the two that will follow. And specifically today, we're going to be addressing the, the issue of establishment, establishing, establishing the forest. We can't cover this in great detail, but I'll give you some insight that might help you uh, uh, as you manage your forest land. So as you look back, it, well, let's put it this way. If we were to go back in time 100 to maybe 150 years and, and studied our landscape, many of us would be appalled at how the landscape looked. In the process of developing our nation, we had um, kind of exploited the land, we had cut too many trees, and the soil and the, the trees alike, it took a toll on them. But through silviculture, through the educated crest of conservation, the land was able to be restored. And um, that's where the profession of forestry and the science of silviculture comes in. The point is that our forests are not heading toward destruction, they're actually returning from it. So let's define the word silviculture. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, we break that word down and we see the Latin word silva, which means forest trees. We also see the word culture, which means controlling the growth of something. So if we put them together, foresters are controlling the growth of forest trees, controlling the growth of forest trees. Now, silviculture is accomplished in three different phases. And so we have the establishment phase, getting the forest started. There are the intermediate operations, which is what do we do to the forest while it is developing? And then the final stage is, uh, I, I refer to it as harvest, is actually a regeneration stage. And eventually we'll get to all three of these legs of the triangle, but today we're gonna to be focusing on the establishment stage of silviculture. So a few concepts I wanted to get across as we get started. Um, that will help you through each leg of the triangle, the silvicultural triangle. And one of the, one of the things you, you need to understand is forest age structure. And so there are different age structures. One example is an even aged forest. This is a stand of trees composed of a single age class originating from an abandoned field or a pasture, maybe a clear cut harvest or even a natural disaster. So for instance, after a tornado has come in and and, and eliminated the trees, it immediately begins growing back to an even age stand. And so here's an example of, a, of an even age stand. These are just saplings, roughly about eight years old. It's an area, it was a cove of a, of a field that was abandoned. The farmer didn't want to farm this little patch anymore. And immediately the forces of succession took over and it grew back to a young even age forest. You're looking at probably about 3000 saplings per acre in that photograph. But likewise, this is also an even age forest. It's just much further advanced. In other words, the tr trees competed with themselves over a course of 80 to 100 years. And of those original 3,000 saplings per acre, we might only have 50 to 75 of the original trees left, but they are both even age forests. Now an even age forest can be differentiated with an uneven age forest. And so an uneven age forest is a situation where we have three or more age classes that are all present in the forest. And I'm not using a photograph to, to depict this, I'm actually using a graph to show you what I mean by an even age forest. So you see our graph and you see on the x-axis uh, the acronym DBH, 
which stands for diameter at breast height. So we measure trees, foresters measure trees at four and a half feet above the ground called DBH or diameter at breast height. And you notice the continuum here, we have small diameter trees and large diameter trees. In other words, they're mature. So small to large. Now on the y-axis, we have the number of trees or the number of stems. So in an uneven age forest, you would expect to have a whole lot of small diameter trees uh, descending all the way down to very few mature trees. It's a reversed J-shaped curve. If you were to plot an uneven age forest, that's what it would look like. Now foresters also talk about crown classes in forest. And so we have four of them that are identified, dominant, co-dominant, intermediate, and suppressed. Dominant trees are those which receive direct sunlight both from the side uh, as well as from the top. And so they are dominant. They receive um, an ample amount of sunlight. And because of that, they typically are big trees that grow up above the rest of the trees. Co-dominant trees, the seas, receive some sunlight from the side, but receive most of their sunlight from the top. So they are co-dominant in nature. Now the intermediate trees, the eyes, they don't receive any sunlight from the side. They receive sunlight only from the top and usually only over, over a portion of the day. So for instance, between say two or 10 and two in, in the day, they might give their, get their shot of sunlight. And then finally, the S trees are those that are suppressed. Um, they're not receiving any direct sunlight. They re receive diffuse sunlight that just happens to make its way down through the forest canopy. So there's a tendency to think that dominant trees are the old ones and S or suppressed trees are the young ones. And that can be the case, oftentimes it is. But in an even aged forest, um, actually all these trees are the same age. It's just that the dominant ones have monopolized the site and um, the suppressed trees are, are eventually going to die because of that. So dominant, co-dominant, intermediate, and suppressed. Now shade tolerance is the ability of a the plant to grow in the shade of another taller plant. That's a concept you need to understand if you're gonna be managing your forest. And so some trees are considered intolerant to shade. So they might get started in the shade, but they don't endure there long because they, they just need a lot of sunlight. And so here's a whole host of trees that uh, are considered intolerant to shade. They won't live uh, for very long in the shade of, uh, of an overstory tree. Now, adjacent to that would be what we call the moderately shade tolerant trees. In other words, these trees can tolerate some shade, but sometime over the course of the day, they need a direct shot of sunlight. And here's an example of, of trees that fall into moderately shade tolerant. And then those that are considered tolerant to shade. Now that doesn't mean that they prefer the shade, but it means that they can live there for a long, long time. Sugar maple, beech, and so forth. Uh, I once saw a picture taken um, at a university forest where they took a snapshot of, of the picture and documented all the trees that were in that picture in the forest. Uh, and then they came back 23 years later and took the same picture. Nothing had happened to the forest. They hadn't uh, harvested anything, they just let it grow. And then they, they redocumented the trees in the second picture. And in the first picture, there was a sugar maple that was two inches in diameter, two inches in diameter. Uh, and in the second picture, 23 years later, that sugar maple was three inches in diameter. So in 23 years, it existed in the shade and only grew an inch. So we call the shade to uh, intolerance the pioneer trees. These typically are the ones that are first to invade a, a sunny site. And these would be the climax trees, the ones that can endure. If there are no disturbances in the forest, like fire or harvesting or storm damage or whatnot, um, these trees will eventually become the climax forest uh, in, in much of the eastern hardwood region. Now, in this establishment stage of the forest, um, oftentimes this is referred to as regeneration. That's the process of renewing a forest. What you'll find is that there are different methods of regeneration. There are natural methods, and then there's artificial methods. Actually, natural methods just essentially means you're allowing the environment to restore uh, the forest itself. In other words, you have no control of the composition. The wind blows seeds in, the birds will defecate seeds, uh, and of course trees come up from that. Squirrels uh, will bury nuts and so forth. So. Um, it's, it's what you get, but you have very little control over this. 
Now, artificial regeneration, this is where we have human man manipulation in the establishment process of the forest. And so we're going to either plant seeds, that's not done very, very often, but it, it can be done, or we're actually planting bare root stock, seedlings in other words. And so as you might expect, the cost of these methods goes up as labor intensity goes up. So natural regeneration is pretty much free, whereas the planting of seeds or seedlings can run the cost up quite a bit. Here's an example of natural regeneration. This is a hickory tree that was already growing in the forest prior to the harvest. So it would have an opportunity to grow once the trees are removed. Here's an example of, of a, a forest uh, about five years after a clear cut. And this is all natural regeneration. These trees weren't planted, they just came in on their own. Looks a little rough in this stage, and it is to the eye, but it's nothing more than a young forest. We like old forest, we like old growth, but we must remember that all old growth begins as young growth. And if you were a self-respecting turkey trying to um, nest, find a nest for your, your, your eggs or protect the poults once they've been uh, hatched, this would be an excellent young forest to be in. Artificial regeneration on the right, this is an example. These are being machine planted. Sometimes they're planted more often. They're probably planted by hand than by machine, but uh, both are examples of artificial regeneration. Now, we need to differentiate between the words reforestation and afforestation. Oftentimes they're used, uh, well, the word reforestation is used uh, for both these examples, but there's a difference. Reforestation is the reestablishment of a forest uh, on land that was prior forested. In other words, it was a forest, you harvested it, and then it's going to, to revert back or come back or be planted back to a forest. This is reforestation. Aforestation is the establishment of a forest on a site that wasn't uh, preceding a forest. It was, in other words, it was a field or was a pasture and whole different sets of, uh, of uh, tree planting um, recommendations depending on if it's reforestation or aforestation. So some requirements for successful artificial regeneration. Uh, the seeds or seedlings should be uh, from within a 100 mile radius of the planting site, or at least similar climate. Now that can be difficult because oftentimes the, the nurseries are two or 300 miles away and they may not know exactly where all those seeds come from other than they, they may say within the state. So that's, that's, that, that's a hard thing to control, but if you can, it would be nice. Um, secondly, the seedling source shouldn't, should not differ within about 300 feet of elevation as well. But the same holds true with that, it, unless you're collecting the nuts and growing the seeds, seedlings yourself, that's a pretty hard thing to control. Um, then also seeds, they may need to be stratified or scarified. Stratification or stratified implies that they have to go through a cold storage. And so walnut and red oak are examples of seeds that have to actually be stored uh, in a cold period over a couple months um, before they'll germinate. Um, other seeds like white oak germinate immediately in the fall of the year, but scarification or scarified, that's the breaking of the seed coat down. And so you can't typically just plant a locust seed if the seed hasn't been scarified first. And oftentimes these these are ingested by animals and that's how scarification occurs. The stomach acids break the seed coat down and as they pass it through, uh, the seed is ready to germinate. Continuing on here, we'll talk about site preparation for regeneration. And the definition of that is you're just manipulating uh, the establishment site. You're trying to improve the overall survival of the seedlings. So you're gonna be controlling the vegetation, the slash, maybe subsoiling if it's compacted soil and or liming or fertilizing. So you, it's, it's good to conduct a, a soil test um, before you plant the trees to see if there's a deficiency. So there's different methods of site preparation. Fire can sometimes be used to expose the mineral soil, particularly if you're relying on natural regeneration, you have some adjacent seed, uh, trees nearby that are a seed source. Uh, this is common more so with pine but fire does improve access for planting too, so it makes it easier to plant. So that's a form of site preparation. As is chemical, this is probably the most common uh, form of site preparation. Um, before you plant, you really need to evaluate the site to, site to see what kind of competition you're gonna have. Is it grasses? Grasses are competitive with trees. They rob the, 
the soil moisture and the fertility. Fescue is disastrous if you're trying to plant trees into fescue. So you need to control your grass first. Um, kudzu naturally is a bad thing too, not because it competes so much for soil moisture and fertility, but because it competes for sunlight. It overtops the seedlings and suppresses them. So those two particularly need to be controlled before you're gonna plant trees. Briars um, aren't a big problem. In fact, weeds in general don't bother me unless they get really tall. Um, they're very dense. So, but you might wanna control the briars and other woody vegetation, broadleaves and so forth. There's mechanical site preparation, which includes disking, perhaps bulldozing if it's, if it's major. There's a roller chopper that's used to chop things up and now they have mulching machines. Um, be careful with disking. I like disking, except if it's done at the wrong time of the year, it exposes the soil right when undesirable trees that may be nearby are seeding or throwing their seed. And so I've seen some real disasters with box elder, um, river birch, sycamore, cottonwood, sweet gum too. They, they drop their seeds uh, all year long, or excuse me, in the winter months. And, um, and then you plant into it not realizing these seeds are there and you end up with more of these undesirable trees than what you want, creating another problem. And then of course, there's just manual site preparation, maybe the use of a chainsaw, herbicide to control some trees that were left out in a, a regeneration opening in a forest and you wanna plant back in those, uh, but you don't wanna bring a dozer in or something like that. Herbicide applications, there are some advantages of that and it's primarily, it's, it's economic. It's, it's much cheaper to spray things and to get out there with, with manual labor and try to control it. It does save time, uh, fewer treatments, and it can be selective. Herbicides are out there to kill grasses, but not broad leaves, uh, to kill hardwoods, but not pines, depending on what your objective is and what you're trying to grow. There's some disadvantages though. They're seasonal. You can't spray a year round, uh, so the timing is important. You, it's possible to kill non-target species if it's careless, there can be some, and I put it in quotation marks, can be some damage to the environment if it's not properly used, but that's why you wanna use licensed herbicide applicators uh, to make sure that it's done right. The research has been done, and we know that we can do it right as long as the directions are followed. So, something to remember, it's better not to have planted than to have planted incorrectly. And so you must begin by matching the species to the, to the site. So what are some site characteristics? What are, what's included in that? Well, the soil, we can't say enough about soil. Um, that really controls the whole planting. And so you need to go to the soil survey and discover what type of soil type you have, and particularly the drainage pattern. Um, if, it's, if there's hard pan or mottled soil, gray, gray color in it, that indicates a high water table or poor internal drainage, and you're limited to the species that you can plant on those sites. Texture refers to the percentage of sand, silt, and clay that's in your soil. Um, that determines what can be planted, of course, fertility, organic matter. You wanna look at the climate too. What is the macro climate? Uh, you don't wanna plant tropical trees in the mountains of, of East Tennessee and vice versa. So think about the climate, what, what species are native, and even the micro climate too, because trees might grow well um, on the cooler side of the hill than on the warmer side of the hill or vice versa. That comes down really to the aspect, which is what direction that a, slo a slope faces. And so we would expect in our region, the south and, and southwesterly slopes to be very dry. And so if you're planting on a hillside that's facing those directions, you, you'll be limited to the species that can be planted there. And then the position on the slope too, are you planting high on a hill, on the side slope, or, or further down, maybe even in a bottom, because all these influence the growth rate of the tree. So working with a forester, a forester will develop a forest management plan and take a tree planting plan uh, and take all of these things into consideration. Now there are some species that are tolerant to drought. Uh, they can endure, endure prolonged dry spells, and that includes cedar, hickory, you can see the list. Uh, White oak, southern red oak are, are moderately tolerant and um, slow starters, but they can endure uh, on, on drier sites better than other species. And the other uh, extreme then would be trees that are intolerant to drought. So you can see the list there. It's a dry site. You don't want to plant northern red oak or, or, or tulip tree on, on that. 
uh, they prefer sites that are uh, what we call mesic, in other words, in the middle, middle of soil moisture regime. Now, once you've matched the species to the site, you're ready now for the, to plant the trees. And um, there's, there's a lot to be said about this, more that can be told in one slide, but a, a few things to consider is that you really need to store those seedlings in, properly because you get them early and maybe you're, you're able to plant them right away, but maybe you can't because of the weather, soil conditions, rain and so forth. And so it's best if you've got something lined up ahead of time where you can put those seedlings uh, where it's cool and humidified. That will keep them in a dormant stage. Now, anytime you're moving the seedlings around, it, it, it's best if they are contained in, in some kind of a trailer that's enclosed to avoid high wind and high temperatures. In the least, um, you need to cover them with a tarp as you're transporting them. And there are reflective tarps that can be used once you get on the site that will reflect the sun's heat away from the seedlings, which is good. Uh, we want to plant in late winter and early spring in our region of Tennessee. Uh, that would include the months primarily of February and March, uh, sometimes in January. But once you get into April, particularly by mid-April, um, it's going to be challenging for the seedlings to survive unless you just, uh, particularly if you have a dry spring. Um, we want to plant on cooler days and at cooler times of the day as well. And so if the temperature gets above about 70, 75 degrees and windy, you probably ought to shut the operation down uh, or plan on uh, uh, stopping pretty soon that time of the day. And then, and then also we wanna plant them correctly. That's an, a science in itself, but we wanna plant to the proper depth. Uh, you'll be able to see where the seedling was in the state, in the nursery. You'll see the soil line. If anything, it's better to plant them a little bit too deep than too shallow and uh, you wanna make sure that the soil is really firmly packed around the seedlings to eliminate the air pockets that might dry out the seedlings. And then do a survival check too, or have your forester help you with that uh, during the, the growing season. Now here's an example of a, a tree spacing chart, uh, and, and uh, you'll see the spacing uh, two feet by two feet all the way down to 25 by 25 feet. And it just gives you an, a, an idea of how many trees that would represent on a per acre basis. So, uh, we see four by four spacing. You're not going to plant trees on a four by four spacing, at least not, not in most situations, but this does closely mimic what's found uh, in a natural forest after it's been harvested, particularly clear cut. You'll have easily up to 3,000 seedlings per acre because they'll be four feet by four feet apart or tighter. Most trees uh, that are planted in, in open settings are planted on a 10 by 10 spacing, which gives you 436 seedlings per acre kind of the minimum that's acceptable is 300 trees per acre in an open setting. You get beyond that and the trees, um, well, the stocking just isn't high enough. The trees are develop into short bodies with open branch structure and not really good lumber. And I've just shown you what a 25 by 25 foot spacing gives you 70 trees per acre. You wanna do the weed control and the mowing. That's very important. I encourage weed control for the first uh, three growing seasons and mowing as well long enough so that the seedlings can get their heads up above uh, the weed competition. And then after that, it shouldn't be a, a big concern unless you have something like uh, kudzu that might give you fits. So what effect does spacing have on these items, on, on these situations? The, the rate of canopy closure, the mortality of the lower branches, uh, the vegetation, um, the height growth of your trees and the first thinning. So what we're, what we're talking about, this spacing chart that I just showed you, um, tighter spacings, um, the, the effect of, of tight spacing is that on the first uh, consideration here, the rate of canopy closure, the canopy is gonna close sooner. As you would expect, if, you, if you've got more trees per acre, the canopy is gonna close up quicker. And that can be a good thing because what will happen is these lower branches will remain smaller and they will die out sooner. And that's important because that gives you cleaner lumber down the road, uh, fewer defects because of the knots. Now regarding the vegetation control, this competition is gonna die out sooner if we have tight spacing. So as you, you can imagine, when the, when the side branches come together and they touch each other, the sunlight's no longer reaching the, the floor and the ground vegetation is going to decline. That can be a bad thing for wildlife. And so it's kind of a trade-off uh, uh, with, with tighter, tighter spacings. Uh, 
Now regarding height growth, trees generally, of course, grow taller initially if you have tight spacing because they're pushing themselves up. They're reaching for that sunlight and so they grow tight, which is what you want early on on your trees before you thin them, which, would, which we'll cover in, in our next session on, um, on silviculture, on intermediate operations. So, and then, of course, your first thinning is going to have to occur sooner if you have a tight spacing. But there are some problems with tight spacing. As I've already mentioned, it has to be thinned sooner. The diameter growth rate um, will be suppressed in tight spacing, and so you've got to thin it out in order to keep the growth rate uh, going. The live crown ratio is reduced, um, and that refers to the, that proportion of the total tree height that has living branches that will be reduced. And the trees can be susceptible to disturbances such as insect and disease, maybe, maybe weather related. Real tight spacing, the trees kind of develop a whippy form and they can sometimes blow over uh, once you do release them. So it, it's, you have to be careful. So, so here's some summary remarks uh, coming straight to you from the back porch. If you're gonna be involved in a tree planting project, begin with a tree planting plan. There are foresters out there that can help you with that. The State Division of Forestry um, develops these plans. And along with that, the plan will qualify you for cost share assistance. So remember this, when you're planting trees, particularly hardwoods, you're typically doing it for the next generation or next generations. And so it, it can be challenging to carry that much of an investment well into the future. And so that's why this cost share to help pay, pay, uh, pay for the establishment of trees. It's important that you do the site preparation. Don't neglect that. Don't bother planting trees if you haven't done the site preparation. It's also important too that you order the trees the summer prior to the planting date, or otherwise if you wait too long, they may be sold out, or you might not get the species that you want. And then plant trees early while they are still dormant. Uh, you really don't want seedlings to be leafed out when you put them in the ground because they're very susceptible to either a late frost or to a drought that can scorch those, those leaves. And then do your weed control and the bush hogging, as I said, for the first three years. And then your forest will be off to a, to a good start. So remember, silviculture is accomplished in three phases. We've addressed the establishments phase today. There's the intermediate operations. And then there's the harvest stage. And so our next session on back porch forestry will be looking at intermediate operations. What do you do to the forest while it is developing? So here's the, the final slide. There's a lot on there. You might want to just pull your camera out and take a picture of that. Uh, or you can write it down. Um, there's a survey that would help me out. I encourage you to go to that uh, website and fill out the survey. And then there's two publications that uh, support what's been addressed today. One's written by me, Tree Planting Procedure for Small Bare Root Seedlings, and the other by Dr. Wayne Clatterbuck, uh, an excellent publication on some site preparation and competition control guidelines if you're gonna plant trees. And so you can just Google either one of those titles uh, and the last name uh, of the author, and it'll pull right up. So I'll leave this up here for a second. And um, I look forward to seeing you in the woods very soon. Thank you for your participation today.